you would turn with me to Acts chapter 19. And while we're doing that, I know Tubb has been in this church an awful long time. And I'm curious if his daughter remembers being in this church as a young child and how many years you were in this church. Shut up. <laughs> 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 okay. All right. So she's actually far more a native to the church than <laughs> than a visitor. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you for being here today. I think we're honored to have you here, uh, and your husband, of course. Uh, if you would join me, Acts chapter nineteen. I'd like to read just the first seven verses. It happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, No, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, Into what then were you baptized? And they said, Into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him, that is, in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. There were in all about twelve men. Father, I thank you for this passage this morning, and I ask that you would take the words that are spoken and that you would place them in people's hearts this morning, that you would help us by your own spirit to hear and then thereby to do what it is you have called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. At the end of chapter 18, we saw that the mighty preacher Apollos left Ephesus. After the humble servants, Aquila and Priscilla, explained to him the parts of the gospel he was missing. Apollos had recently then arrived over in Corinth while Paul was circling down from the north in northern Turkey, and he himself arrived in Ephesus. So essentially, they just missed each other. One leaving Ephesus, the other arriving. That would be verse (laughs) 1. If you go to verse 2 with me, He said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Paul arrives in Ephesus. He encounters a group of 12 disciples, we're told. And after talking with them some, begins to have some doubts about the fullness of their faith. I think you'll see. Noting some missing parts. And like Apollos, but I think to a greater degree, their theology was deficient. And there is great debate among many scholars, and you will find them in many churches, um, whether or not in this section of Scripture they were Christians or not Christians. You'll find great debate. Some suggesting that they were true believers who simply had not yet received the Holy Spirit. And when I say scholars, I mean their entire commentaries written by, by theologians. Of course, you will find people on the opposite side that there is no such thing as a Christian without the Holy Spirit. So this is where the debate will come. Paul then asks them plainly about the Holy Spirit, and they claim ignorance of the third person of the Trinity. Right? That's what it says. (laughs) Verse 3, he says, Then into what were you baptized, if you did not know about the Holy Spirit? And they said, into John's baptism. This is John the Baptist. Right. So Paul wonders if they can describe their baptism. And by the way, this is a great way to talk to people. Ask them questions. This is what you believe. Can I ask you a few more questions so that we can you know, get more clarity? Before you pronounce <laughs> a judgment, make sure you understand what's going on. He does that. He wants to clarify. And ultimately, the true status of their salvation. This is what Paul is very interested in. 
I would say with him, because of their faulty beliefs, following John the Baptist and being in the same city where Apollos had just been teaching, most scholars see these as Apollos' disciples. It just fits, even though it's not stated. And Paul here is concerned about truth, absolute truth, not feelings, not preferences, but truth. And if you were in Sunday school this morning, we had great conversations about our conscience and what God uh, helps us to think. Today, we're going to see some of this now. As a follower of Christ, each one of us should also be concerned with truth, right? Does truth matter? Let me say something. If you say truth doesn't matter, I assume that's a true statement. Do you see the problem? I'm going to help you with that in a second. <laughs> I assume that like me as a believer, what you believe, you believe to be true. Or else why would you believe it? It makes sense. Okay. And if you believe it is true, you also believe that those things in opposition to it are not also true. That's how our logical minds work. So for instance, in a logical world, if I claim that one, we'll do it this way, one plus one, equals 2, I cannot at the same time claim that 1 plus 2 equals 2. It doesn't work, does it? I can't do that. We know that. And we need to use this uh, logic that we are given by God because in our world today, they would like to disregard notions of truth, at least absolute truth. The world wants you to disregard genders in the same way as they want you to disregard God having created this universe. I have a slide I'd like to put up here. Here's a statement that you might, well, I need the words too. We have no words. We were having some difficulties earlier. We have lots of cool slides, but no words. So that's okay. If there were words there, it would say there is no such thing as absolute truth. There is no such thing as absolute truth. It's a very popular slogan that's often thrown in the face of Christians when we try to talk about the Bible or God. There's no such thing as absolute truth. But if this statement is true, it refutes itself and becomes false, right? I mean, that's the way it works. If there's no such thing as truth, then that statement itself comes into question. And you need to let people know that. Okay, how about another one? Next slide. No one can know anything for certain. No one can know anything for certain. It's another clever way, again, to keep Christians from talking about the truth or about God. Well, you can't know for certain. It's just not possible. Because they would say, in order to know for certain, you would have to know everything to be able to make the claim that there is an absolute truth. You would have to know everything. Well, if this is the only way truth statements work, then how do they know that truth? You have to ask them. If I have to know everything to be able to make a truth statement, do you know everything in order to be able to make that statement? Isn't that interesting? I know, your brains are, some of you, this isn't how you think. How about the third one here? Words have no meaning, and meaning changes. Words have no meaning. Or they might even say meaning changes. Well, the irony is you can go to Amazon in the philosophy section, and you can buy dozens and dozens of books written on this topic except they're written with words. <laughs> Trying very, very hard to tell you, the reader, that words have no actual meaning, that they're just symbols, and that the meaning changes. Well, once again, <laughs> number one, why are you trying to tell me with words that words have no meaning? And number two, if meaning changes, I'm guessing this no longer is valid. Okay. I, for some of you, this was weird. For others, I hope you see some of the problems with logic when people throw it at you in an attempt to discredit the truth. 
You cannot say there is no truth without stating a truth statement. It's just the way it works. Well, Paul is interested in the truth. And you and I need to be interested in the truth. Why would we tell somebody about God or about the Bible if we didn't believe in truth? Why would we tell them things we don't believe or that we didn't think were applicable to them? Well, we do. So we have to be ready. Um, and we, we can take the slide down. Um, <laughs> you see, the confused world out there, the masses, they want you to claim that gods of all religions are equal. And that in reality, they're all saying the same thing. In fact, you will find these statements. They're all really, they're all worshiping the same God just in a different way. Because that sounds very inclusive and very gentle and very loving and very non-confrontational. Except it's not true. You only have to examine the gods that they worship and then contrast them with the gods of the Bible and you will find these are not the same gods. That's what you have to do. So don't let the statement fool you. If you were to look at the God of Islam, for instance, and you were to read what the God of Islam says in the Quran, it's in English, you can read it, you would find that it sounds very, very different from the God of the Bible. Because the God of Islam says that he is the father of all lies and he is the best liar. That's in the Quran. And he said that against Satan in the Quran. <laughs> in other words, you're really good, but I'm better. Well, this doesn't sound anything like the God of the Bible. So don't let people tell you we're really just worshiping the same gods. It doesn't work. Notice it didn't work that way with logic. It doesn't work that way with the Bible either. For this will get your blood pumping for just a second, but would anybody here say that Trump and Biden are the same person? No, right? Would anybody here claim that Jesus and Buddha and Muhammad were all really the same person? If you do, I'm available for lunch. <laughs> we can discuss that. You see, our feelings are always changing. Right? Sometimes you feel a certain way in the morning, you feel different at night. Our feelings change. And they often overlook reality. You can't trust your feelings for reality. And sometimes our imaginations get in the way and we imagine things. God gave us emotions and God gave us reason and he expects us to use them the right way. So now, Isaiah 1 verse 18 states, the Lord says, come, let us reason together. That's what God says. Well, he wouldn't ask that of a person who couldn't reason, who didn't have that function. God said, come let us reason together. God did not make us as mindless robots. And as we know, we often choose both right and wrong. So what if a friend of yours states that you both believe in Jesus, but her view is actually that Jesus is the brother of Satan. Huh. Interesting, isn't it? It's very possible that you meet someone like that. Or what if your uncle believes God has a physical body and before he was God, he was a man just like you, walking around on the earth. Or maybe a coworker tells you that Mary, the mother of Jesus, never actually had any other children. She was taken up to heaven, sinless, and there she stands beside God mediating for your sins. Is that what the Bible says? Any of that? No. You have to know. That's why I said truth matters an awful lot. You have to know the difference. You see, in the Bible, when it talks about God, it talks about a God who has no beginning and no end. No beginning and no end. And that he is spirit. So we cannot ascribe a body or a beginning to God. So if your view is, well, he had a body and he was created at some point, your view is in opposition to what the Bible says. And if the Bible states in that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
Through him all things were made. Without him nothing has been made has been made. It also says in Revelations chapter 1, Jesus is speaking, I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come. No beginning, no end. Then if that is true, it cannot also be true that he was created and is the brother of Satan. It can't be. It seems obvious, and it is obvious, that they cannot both be true. So don't let somebody say, well, we all actually worship the same God. Not if you say that. Then we have different gods, and one is real and one is not real. In Matthew 13, I'm going to read for you Matthew 13, verses 53 through 57. And I'm going to start with, if this is true, it's in the Bible, but I'm going to say, if Matthew 13, 53 through 57 is true, which says, when Jesus had finished these parables, he moved on from there, and coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, aren't all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. So if this is in the Bible and this is stated as true, then it cannot also be true that Mary remained a perpetual virgin as the Catholic Church claims and never had any children because now we have a problem with the Bible. You see? It does say that there were other children, other brothers and sisters. All this to say truth matters, and it matters a lot. We need to know what is true about the Bible so that we can know what is not true. Paul recognized in these 12 disciples they were missing the complete truth. And not only did he recognize that, he was brave enough to exert the effort to correct that. They needed to know the actual truth. So back in our Acts 19, verse 3, and he said unto, what were you baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. Well, since they hadn't even heard of the Holy Spirit, Paul knew something was wrong. That's a problem. And if you don't believe in the Holy Spirit, or maybe like the Jehovah's Witnesses, you believe the whole, they don't say the Holy Spirit. They call it the Spirit. And if you're a Jehovah's Witness, you believe that that is God's power or impersonal force. Is that what the Bible describes the Holy Spirit as? No, it doesn't. So this is why we have to know the difference. It isn't. The Holy Spirit is not God's power. It isn't the title for his power. The Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity and has all the personal person attributes that Jesus and the Father have. And I would say, when you read this story, the fact that Paul stops on this point should point you to the fact that this is important. He stopped. He said, no, we're missing something here. So verse 4, Paul said, John, whom they just talked about, baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him, that is in Jesus. Well, to find this story, you could turn to Luke chapter 3, verse 3. Luke 3, 3 tells us that John the Baptist went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That's exactly what Paul just said, isn't it? That means Paul knew. The Bible confirms itself. Okay, if you continue in Luke chapter 3, verse 15, we read, the people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might be the Messiah. And John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Those are different things, aren't they? 
Yes, John knew. John knew. They didn't. So Paul adds the missing parts of the gospel. He said, look, you need to believe in him that John the Baptist was talking about. Jesus. It's not enough that we have a vague idea of God and a vague idea of the concepts in the Bible. And it's not enough that we come to church. Because as I said in Sunday school, you can have non-believers in church, right? It's not enough. And it's not enough that we sing the hymns we love. And we may love them, but it's not enough. No. In fact, it's not enough, not enough that you would follow all the Old Testament laws and you only ate kosher food. That's not enough either. You must know the Jesus of the Bible, not a different one. And people will use the word and the name Jesus, and they mean somebody different. You must know the Jesus of the Bible. You must know who he is and what he did. We have to know this. You must believe that, number one, he has always been God. He didn't become God one day. And he is a part eternally of the Trinity. And although Jesus was sinless, he paid for all sin on the cross. But he didn't stay there, did he? No, he rose. He paid the sin, he rose, and then he offered his hand to sinners. That's what you have to know. Nothing else. You accept the hand, you accept the forgiveness, he takes a little bit of your sin away. No, he takes all the sin away. Again, don't let somebody fool you. Know your Bible. He takes all your sin. It's all wiped away. He has paid it. And then his righteousness is now upon you. His, not yours. Okay, you need to know these. In fact, Peter said all of this himself in Acts chapter 4. By now, we've all forgotten Acts chapter 4. So I will read it for you. Acts chapter 4, Peter says, Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else. No one else. For there is, Peter says, no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. So either you're going to believe what Peter says, or you can believe all kinds of other things, but you can't believe both. You can't believe Allah, and you can't believe other cults and religions, and also believe Peter says there's only one name. There's only one person. See, you have to believe the right things. Verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there it is. Now they place their faith not in John's baptism of a future Messiah. They now believed in Jesus Christ who had come. And now they were baptized. So how do you know that they weren't believers before and they are now? If that's the view you would hold. Well, verse 6. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came upon them. That's how you would know. The proof that the disciples had, I believe, not been believers is that once the profession of Christ was made, they received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came and took residence inside of them. That means they were a new creation. And he gave them ministry gifts, gifts specific for ministry. Paul would clarify this point, if you're interested, in Romans chapter 8, verse 9. Romans 8, verse 9, Paul said, You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit God lives in you. If anyone, Paul says, does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. Let me read it again. <laughs> If anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. That's what the Bible says. And if Christians, Paul would write himself in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Paul writes, do you not know that you are a temple of God 
and the Spirit of God dwells in you. Paul wasn't confused. Jesus promised this very same event in the book of John. John chapter 14, verse 17, where he said, The Spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Then I would say with the Bible, there is no such thing as a Christian devoid of the Holy Spirit. It just the, the two don't go together. That's what the Bible seems to indicate. Well, then, let's go to verse 6. Again, Paul laid hands on them. The Holy Spirit came on them. They began speaking with tongues and prophesying. This will be the last mention of the gift of tongues in the book of Acts. For those of you that were following or taking notes. And the most normative reading of the Greek points to known languages of people. When it says tongues here. If you're not from a Latin-based language, so in other words, if you're an English speaker, this distinction isn't as obvious. But in the Latin-based languages, if Alina and I were to describe what language are they speaking over there in, in Germany, if we were to say this in French or Italian or Spanish or Romanian, we would say the word tongue. What tongue are they speaking there over in Germany? It's very common. That's how we would say language. It's not as common in English, and that's why it gets a little confusing. It means language. So, why do I say that? It's a side note, and I will give you your homework for this afternoon. <laughs> Out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, if you're interested, in verse 1 is the only place that Paul or the Bible mentions angelic tongues. That's 1 Corinthians 13.1, the only place that mentions it. And I will add that, sorry, let it fly. Paul makes an argument right there, not from personal ability, but stating that even if, it's an even if statement, even if he had the gift to speak in all the human and angelic languages, but did not have godly love running through his veins, even such a gift would be worthless. That's what Paul says. He did not say he had it, or you have it, or I have it. He just said, even if I did, but I didn't have the love of God, none of that matters. So that's, you can study that later. That's 1 Corinthians 13. Now, having established that a Christian without the Holy Spirit is actually not a Christian, I think, then what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? That's interesting, isn't it? For that, I would like you, if you don't mind, to turn to Ephesians chapter 5. So that'll be to the right in your Bibles. Right after Corinthians, Galatians, and Ephesians chapter 5. And I'd like to read, you can follow along, verses 15 through 20. We're going to talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's very important here. Paul says here, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The idea here is not that we can have more Holy Spirit or that we somehow have a slow leak and we need to recharge the Holy Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit is a condition to which we come if we follow Ephesians chapter 5. The Bible teaches that our sin and our flesh, they work to draw us away. They work to draw our hearts away from the life-giving relationship with God. That's our sinful nature. It's, it's trying to draw us away. And if you were to turn to uh, chapter 4 of Ephesians, 
Paul lists a variety of sinful attitudes and actions that will cause us to take our eyes off of Christ. Many, many things will cause us to do that. If you're there, starting in verse 2, Paul tells Christians, Therefore, each one of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. He goes on, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, and brawling, and slander, along with every other form of malice. Notice in verse 30 that the result of sinful attitudes, sinful lifestyles in you can grieve the Holy Spirit living within you. That is what it says, right? It is what it says. If we continue to sin, if we let our hearts and our minds get corroded by the lies of the world, we will step off the path of righteousness that the Spirit is leading us on. We will make those bad choices. And if our hearts are bent on evil, if we look to destroy others, and if hate is governing our thoughts, then we are going to essentially choke off that lifeline of the Holy Spirit. That's how we grieve the Holy Spirit. It's a lifeline. I thought about this. I don't know if it's a good analogy. It may not be, but I thought about it. It's like the blood in your veins. You ever fallen asleep and you had your arm bent? And you didn't know it, but you were cutting off the circulation there. And you wake up and you can't feel your fingers and it gets all tingly. What if you were to put a rubber band around there really tightly for a long time? You would effectively cut off the lifeline of the blood, paralyze the hand. That's the idea. The Holy Spirit is our lifeline, spiritually speaking. And we, by our own sinful attitudes, can choke off and grieve the Holy Spirit. But Paul says, don't do that. We don't want to do that. Do you want to grieve the Holy Spirit that's inside of you? Here, of course, Paul mentions things like alcohol. We know what drugs and alcohol do, but there are many, many things that do this things that distort the truth in our own hearts and minds, such that we believe things that aren't true. Maybe uh, some people add a little New Age thing here to their beliefs, a little, a little New Age ritual that they like that sounds exciting, and they, they put it in with their Christian beliefs. You're going to distort the truth. And too many bad advisors in your life that you allow to advise you, too many bitter people that walk the life with you, too many atheists that you're living with, and it isn't long, and you are going to step off the path of righteousness. You have to be ever so careful. The Bible tells believers instead to be filled with the Holy Spirit instead of the evil of the world. So Galatians 5, I'm not going to read a lot of it, but in Galatians 5, we will learn that, Paul says there, the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. He says they are in conflict with each other. And then Paul ends by saying, so, as Christians, you need to walk by the spirit. And when you do that, you will no longer gratify the desires of the flesh. That's what Paul says. And so anytime some hateful ideas come to mind, or if we begin to gossip, or if we disrupt people that are serving God and, and fall into addiction, if we allow ourselves down those paths, we have stepped off the path 
that the Holy Spirit is putting us on. And I say, even if you're trying to solve all your problems by yourself, you know, you've got prob legal problems, you've got financial problems, you've got relational problems. If you're trying to do all that by yourself, you're not letting God do his part. That's the lifeline that we have to have. If you're no longer, no longer listening to the Holy Spirit in your own time, if you stopped reading his word on your own time, if you no longer have time for prayer in your life, in fact, you have a lot of things you do on the weekend, and church isn't even important, well, then you've stopped. You've stopped the Holy Spirit's words from ringing in your ears. You are effectively grieving the Spirit. And we should never do that. Again, I thought there's a sense in which we're like unruly children that our Heavenly Father is looking down upon with great sadness as we wreck our lives doing our own things. And if you've been a parent, sometimes you've seen that. But we don't want to do that. So we want to end on the right thing. And I would return to Galatians chapter 5. I forgot to write down the chapter, so you'll have to read the whole Galatians chapter 5. <laughs> 16. Well, uh, and the men studied it, but um, this is a, it's a great verse. I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll find it. Um, <laughs> Galatians chapter 5, I think it's, um, it may be chapter 5, it might be chapter 6, I don't know. Paul says, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Isn't that an interesting picture? Now, that's probably the NIV, but that's okay. Let us keep in step with the Holy Spirit. That means you have to be walking with him. You can't walk that way or another way. You must walk with the Holy Spirit. And then he says, we will know we are keeping in step with the Holy Spirit because we will be interested in the things of the Lord. Then you'll know. That's the evidence. You'll want to meet with other Christians You'll want to bring joy to them and build them up. That you will be walking in the Spirit. And that's how we will, according to Ephesians 5, 19 through 20, that's how we'll fulfill and, and know we're walking in step. I'm going to read that, and that's all you're going to get today. <laughs> Ephesians 5, 19 and 20. If you and I are walking in the Spirit, it says, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit singing and making music from our hearts to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. May it be so in our church also.